I am especially delighted to introduce to you and spend some time with a remarkable individual that I had the opportunity to get to know a little bit this summer during an event we did together, um, Swami Sarvatriyananda. It's been a real honor. I've been looking forward to this for months, but I will read a very short bio about this amazing individual. We're just gonna jump right in. There's so many things that I want to discuss with them. So Swami Sarvatriyananda is a Hindu monk belonging to the Ramakrishna order. He is the current Swami and head of the Vedanta Society of New York, position he's held there since 2017. From childhood, childhood onwards, he is inclined towards spirituality and was inspired by the lives of Sri Ramakrishna and Swami Vivekananda. His family is also devoutly religious. His parents and grandparents were initiated devotees in the Ramakrishna order. And I love this about you, Swamiji. He said he has stated that his first goal in life was to become a pilot, and the second was to find God. And I think in a certain way, you can become a pilot to fly towards God, right? He becomes your co-pilot. So my dear friend, it's so great to have you. Oh, the one thing I also wanted to, to say to my community, one of the reasons I'm particularly thrilled to have Swamiji with us is because he has taken it up upon himself to really soak um, in Western philosophy, scientific doctrines, and also Buddhism. Last year, you studied extensively with God, Professor Garfield, I believe, studying Majamaka and the teachings of the Garjana and emptiness. And so I'm continually impressed with your willingness and ability to spread out across all these various disciplines to augment your own understanding and basically to develop your skill set to communicate with especially Westerners. So I am extraordinarily honored and thrilled that you've taken the time to spend uh, to talk to us this morning. Thank you so much. Thank you for having me, Andrew. It's a pleasure and a privilege to be on this forum with you. Thank you, thank you. But my community, Swamiji, is, is um, largely predisposed towards Buddhism and the Tibetan Buddhist world. And so maybe we could start, if you don't mind, just a little bit talking about the relationship between Vedanta proper and then Advaita Vedanta. What, what are the similarities and differences and what can we glean from both? The students of Buddhism, for instance, why would it behoove us to explore something like Advaita Vedanta? What, what can Buddhists learn from this noble tradition? So a couple of questions in there. Um, well, yes, um, Vedanta literally means the end of the Vedas. Uh, Vedas, as we know, are the uh, primary and the most ancient scriptures of the Hindu tradition. Uh, end of the Vedas does not literally mean physically the end of the texts, which we now call the Vedas. Uh, but the final or the highest philosophical spiritual teachings of the Vedas, and they are found in texts called Upanishads, which form part of the Vedic corpus. So um, one way we can define Vedanta is the spiritual knowledge that we get from the Upanishads. Um, the term, the Sanskrit definition, which we memorized as novices was Vedanta Nama Upanishad Pramanam the source of spiritual knowledge called the uh, Upanishads is Vedanta. Now, multiple commentators who explained the Upanishads in different ways gave rise to the various schools of Vedanta. So just for, for example, there is Advaita Vedanta, non-dual Vedanta. There is Vishishta Advaita Vedanta, qualified monistic Vedanta. There is Dvaita Vedanta, dualistic Vedanta. And here, non-dual dualistic, these all refer to um, ontological categories. How many realities are there in this universe? If it is one without a second, then you have Advaita. It literally means non-dual, not two. But if it's an organic whole where everything is included within uh, one reality, you have Vishishta Advaita Vedanta. If there are actual pluralities, there is a God of the universe, there is a universe, there are individual separate uh, sentient and insentient beings, then you have dualistic, which basically means pluralistic Vedanta. So you have these vast differences within the Vedantic tradition itself. I personally belong to a, a, what you might call a, a reform movement within Hinduism originating in the late 19th century, but which is rooted in Advaita Vedanta, but in a more a general, more liberal way, which tends to incorporate various parts of the entire spiritual tradition of Hinduism. Now, if I move on to the second part of the question, why should we be interested? Why should, for example, a person who's studying Tibetan Buddhism be interested in Advaita Vedanta? 
for that we have to go back 2000 years or more within a few centuries of the buddha they were already proliferating a lot of philosophical discussion um, between the different schools um, prevalent at that time some of which belong to what we call hinduism today some of which belong to buddhism and there was intense debate between them so this actually led to the flowering of uh, indian philosophy this uh, nearly thousand years of debate between Buddhist and Hindu schools, within the Hindu schools, within the Buddhist schools, and between Hinduism and Buddhism, the, the philosophical schools. It was really beneficial for uh, Indian philosophy. It led to the development of, um, of um, um, logic, of um, epistemology, um, metaphysics also, and uh, discussions on, on ethics and uh, ultimately the nature of spiritual enlightenment, freedom, and so on. So it's good to know um, the traditions against which, for example, your native tradition has been debating. Mm. And then you begin to see why you are saying, or we are saying the things that we are saying, or trying to prove, what are we arguing against? What are we trying to prove? Uh, these are very ancient uh, systems of thought. Uh, so that is one reason. Um, more so, we find uh, strange, I would say, synchronicities, a mirror image like uh, thinking, which developed within these traditions. So if you look at just the language of Madhyamika and uh, the language of Advaita Vedanta, uh, what they're trying to say, I think it, it's so extraordinarily, almost eerily, uh, uh, you know, like echoing each other. They're not saying, they're not, they don't, they're not exactly the same, but they're more like mirror images of, of each other. But sometimes they use exactly the same language. Nagarjuna uses language which is uh, often Upanishadic. Um, so one way of understanding one's own tradition is to not only look at the traditions which are different from it and have been engaged in debate and uh, helped in the formation of your tradition, but which are also, um, which at least seem to be very similar to your tradition, and yet just that maddeningly bit, little bit different, which actually throws a lot of light on, on, on our own understanding of our tradition. Let me give one example. Yes, I please. think a, co a quote. Uh, yes. Yes, please go ahead. Just one example, and I'll, I'll wrap this up. Uh, it's uh, so, how do I see, for example, the Tibetan Buddhist synthesis, basically there are multiple schools which have gone into what is Tibetan Buddhism today, primarily uh, the emptiness school and the mind only school, the Madhyamaka school and the Vigyanavada school, or Chit 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 Chitamatra school. Um, that synthesis and Advaita Vedanta. So how do, how do I see them together? Um, the way I see it is this, one misunderstanding of uh, the um, uh, Madhyamaka mind only synthesis, or let's just call it the Madhyamaka school. Mm -hmm. Consistently, the way the Hindu schools have attacked the Madhyamaka school has been as portraying it as nihilism, mm -hmm. as they're saying that ultimately there's nothing, which is on the surface patently unfair because again and again, Nagarjuna and Chandrakirti and others have repeatedly said that's not what we are trying to say. We are not trying to talk about, you know, asadvad and the non-existence of anything at all, the nihilism, no. Um, so one way of misunderstanding, a common way of misunderstanding Madhyamaka is to say that they say um, nothing exists. Um, then the, the common way Advaita has been uh, characterized when it's being attacked, uh, much, much less so in the, uh, in the Madhyamaka tradition. But when they have actually criticized Advaita or targeted Advaita, it has been as eternalism. Yes, there yes. is something that you're talking about. Brahman, yes. uh, it's a thing you're talking about. Yes. Now, the way I put these two together is that if you correct these errors, then you begin to see both of them are talking about no thing. Yes, it's exactly. not nothing. Exactly. <laughs> it's not a thing, uh, but it is no thing. Exactly. And uh, that's not an abstract and that's the category that's not something very conceptual that is actually the heart of reality itself compared to that nothing and something are abstractions basically yes okay so that that's something that i take away from my uh, study of both traditions that's fantastic and, and i think it's also since we're getting into some granularities here swamiji to, to throw into the mix also the difference between the classic 
Wrong Tong or consequentialist Majamaka schools, which as you know, really didn't posit anything, right? Whatever was brought to a consequentialist, it was non-affirming negation. They simply shredded what was ever presented yeah. and didn't assert anything. And that of course is where their, their nihilistic accusations were leveled. But then, and this isn't um, perhaps as commonly known, I'm not, I'm not sure if even Professor Garfield talked about this, but then there's what is called the Shentong Majamaka School, the empty of other schools, which is where, okay, after you've cut, 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 removed, removed the, the, the apathetic way, the via negativa, there is something left, but of course, it's not a thing. And then so what that is then becomes the charter of the Shentong School to assert what that is, the, the Buddha nature teachings, the, the, the quality of reality as being um, made of the nature of light, for example. Um, and so I, I find it, 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 since we're already on this track, in addition to what you just said, Swamiji, what else have you learned from, um, in particular, the Tibetan Buddhist schools? When you go into that arena and you study us, what is it that you, you have learned that you've been able to augment your own understanding of your tradition with? Right. Um, let me start a little uh, anecdote uh, about my experience studying uh, Tibetan Buddhism academically at, at okay. Harvard. Uh, so the first time I entered Professor Garfield's uh, class on, on Madhyamaka, and he is a, a great enthusiast about Madhyamaka. You know, he, he would start his class by saying, if you can do Madhyamaka, why do anything else? <laughs> All the other stuff that you're doing at the Harvard Divinity School in the philosophy department, none of that, you know, it, is, it comes even close to the joy of doing Madhyamaka. So when I entered the class, he knew, uh, he knows our tradition. Uh, when he goes to Calcutta, for example, he's pretty close to our main monastery and he stays at our guest house. There's some, he had stayed there. So the moment I entered the class, he said to me, Swami, keep your Advaita outside the door, <laughs> which is actually good advice because especially if there are two traditions which are in some ways similar at least, uh, then it is uh, good to bracket it off you know, in a sort of a Husserlian sense to bracket off the other traditions so that you can immerse yourself in this tradition and learn it properly. So, but that's one side of it. Just outside the class, outside Harvard Yard, I was walking down to uh, the university one day and I met this Tibetan monk uh, on the street and he grinned at me and, I, uh, and said, what are you doing here? And I said, what are you doing here? Uh, um, so I told him that I'm studying, actually studying your tradition with Professor Garfield at the, at the university. And he said he was the Tibetan Buddhist chaplain for uh, Harvard University, oh. Lama Mik Mikmar. Um, and then he said to me, you are an Advaitin, right? Uh, Advaita Vedanta. I said, yes. And then with a broad smile, he said, oh, it is the same thing. Oh, wonderful. <laughs> so you just put these two together, you know, like they are different, keep them apart. Good, that's one way. But they're ultimately the same thing. I think. Um, so, yeah, it makes good academic sense to keep them apart when you're trying to learn. And it makes ultimate sense to see that both are pointing towards. They're different pointers, but they are pointing towards the same thing. Now, um, multiple things which really helped me uh, in my own understanding of Advaita Vedanta and understanding of, um, of you know, the mind only school and the emptiness school. Um, the feeling I got while studying the development of the emptiness school from Nagarjuna to Chandrakirti and um, Bhava Viveka and, and then further down to the Nalanda tradition, then the further development in Tibet. Mm -hmm. So that we are talking about, about nearly 2000 years, all, more or less 2000 years of development. And as you say, written in Sanskrit by Nagarjuna and, and Chandrakirti, and then in commentaries in Tibetan, old Tibetan, written yeah. nearly a thousand years ago by, you know, Mabja, Songkhapa and others, and then translated into almost incomprehensible English. And we are read, studying that stuff in, at, at Harvard now. Um, I got the feeling of, uh, you know, the beautiful structures that we see today in Advaita Vedanta or uh, in Tibetan Buddhism, for example, the Madhyamaka that is taught, the fully developed form that is taught now. But while studying that, you feel that you have gone back to the construction site where the yes. buildings have not yet come up, the materials are arriving and the concrete mixtures are churning away. Um, you know, the workers are working at it and things are coming up and coming down again. Uh, it's a, uh, it seems messy, 
but you recognize the contours of what is going to come. Um, so this huge debate for nearly, well, for more than a thousand years, I would say, which formed the center of our study at, at Harvard was the debate between the Prasangika uh, yeah. school and the uh, Swatantrika school. Uh, and what all that came out of it, uh, whether uh, metaphysically or epistemologically, logically, and uh, in terms of um, spirituality, uh, yeah. practice. Yeah. So but that's, those are the areas in which I gained, I, I gained better understanding. Oh, that's beautiful. And, and I couldn't agree more with you. And I think it should be more widely proclaimed, Swamiji, that, that the Buddhist notion of anatma, no self, is phenomenologically equivalent to the big S self of the Vedantic tradition. I mean, really, right. it's, it's different words pointing to the same reality, wouldn't you say? Yeah, that's the, um, the million dollar or billion dollar question. Are they different words pointing to the same reality? Before going into that course at Harvard, I would have said, yes, that was my feel. I would still say yes at this um, uh, point. Only that I have begun to appreciate uh, that, you know, the, the uniquenesses of both approaches. Hmm. The, the Hindu mind has a peculiarly synthetic ability of, you know, going in everywhere and saying, oh, it's all the same. Yeah. Now, <laughs> yes, it, but only in an ultimate sense. And if you see the differences, you actually appreciate each system for its uniqueness and it helps you in your spiritual growth. Um, so uh, uh, yes, they ultimately point to the same thing. Let me give you, for example, somebody who doesn't agree with this. I agree with what you said. Um, we are in agreement there. Ultimately, in terms of paramarthika, that is the absolute truth, mm -hmm. they are pointing to, I think, virtually the same thing. Um, but here is somebody who doesn't agree, mm -hmm. or at least apparently doesn't agree, and that's Professor Garfield. What is his take on Madhyamaka? Um, one place he says that uh, if studying Madhyamaka, you get the feeling of falling into a, into a never-ending well, you know, like dropping in there without any seas, uh, bottomless drop, then you have got Madhyamaka, which, uh, if I'm asked to take a, take a call on it, it is only partially true. Exactly. exactly. Yeah. Yeah. As far as conceptual formulations of the truth are concerned, it's good to keep on doing the Madhyamaka analysis, the um, Chatushpa, the, the, the tetra, uh, tetralemma. tetralemma. You, yeah. Yeah. you keep on applying it and dissolving it so that each time it points back to something that you intuitively or self-luminously know to be the truth, which is already there. Yeah. It's, it's not, you're not dropping into a void of meaninglessness and pointlessness, not like that. Yeah, I don't no. think he meant it that way, but he expressed it that way. Yes, I think that's really true, Swamiji, because the vortex, the, the, the sense of, of um, in fact, Trump Rinpoche uh, said it beautifully when he said, the bad news is you're falling through space without a parachute. The good news is there is no ground. And so on one level, what he's talking about is the, the, um, the vortex, and I would even say the chipper, you know, those roadside chippers that chew up the, the wood, Yes. You're falling through a chipper, and your your affective response to that is in fact one of of annihilation or falling and descent. But that's only the annihilation of, like you said, returning to the construction site. It's the deconstruction of the concepts, the, the adventitious defilements. And that from a true perspective, it's actually it's not a, a, a vertigo, it's a sense of complete freedom and relief. Because if you relate to it as it is without reference to the self. It isn't this cataclysmic event. That, that only comes about like a thunderclap immediately after the strike of insight, uh, insight comes the thunderclap of concept. And that's where the, some of the disquieting notions I think come into play. Wouldn't you say? I, I agree entirely. That's, that was beautifully put. Uh, that is the deconstruction of the conceptual formulations which we set up uh, and the problem with the conceptual formulations is they are at least one step away from the truth. That's right. The, the truth itself is not amenable to being squeezed within uh, any conceptual framework. And I think that's basically what Nagarjuna was trying to point out when he says, Shunyata Sarva Drishtinam, the emptiness of all philosophies. The emptiness of all philosophies is the emptiness of all philosophical formulations of the truth. Um, now, the danger in Advaita Vedanta, for example, is what the emptiness school would call the substantialist danger. 
Yes. That when you try to positively state the truth, you end up almost like implying there is an eternal, non-changing thing, which is the ground of the universe. Do you see, thing, ground, eternal, non-changing, they all sound pretty yeah. substantial. Yeah. And though that's not exactly what is meant, but we, the mind takes it that way. We are predisposed to think in that, that way. And therefore, the um, emptiness dialectic is very useful. Uh, to you get a grasp on it, then quickly deconstruct it, and you're left with freedom, with, with the infinite. I couldn't agree more, Swamiji. But let, let me ask you this, since we're, I, I love the depth that we're reaching right away. Um, it's not so much in, in fashion as it once was, but the whole postmodernist, radical relativist approach. Do you, in fact, from your understanding of both Buddhism and um, Hinduism, does reality, in fact, bottom out? Is, is it an infinitely sliding scale, or does reality fundamentally bottom out into whatever, no thingness, light, or, or, or some matrix of reality, which I believe in your tradition you refer to as pure consciousness or pristine consciousness. So is, is there some kind of um, end to the, to the descent into reality? I mean, is there, is there a point where we can say truly absolute truth is in fact the nature of things. Let me give a simple answer first and then complicate it. Okay. Simple, answer, simple answer is yes. Okay. If, if you ask me to be straight and put it out there straight, yes. And I think both the emptiness school and Advaita Vedanta are also, um, they, are sim they give that simple direct answer. There is an absolute truth. Um, that is, I'm literally quoting Nagarjuna here. Uh, when he says, Buddha taught two truths one absolute one, the relative, um, paramartika and samritti satyam. And the relative truth is relative only to the absolute. It is helpful. It is practical. It is helpful. It helps us to live our day-to-day -day, uh, lives. And most importantly, it helps us to access the absolute truth. Yes. Nagarjuna says, um, samritti manasritya paramartham nadi gachati. That means, this is from the Madhyamaka Karika. Yeah. Without the support of the relative truth, the transactional truth, Nobody ever comes to the absolute truth. And that's the importance of the uh, transactional truth, ultimately. And Advaita Vedanta would agree totally there. Um, now, complicating that is, let me give an example which I'm fond of, is that of gold and ornaments. Mm. Um, do ornaments bottom out? Ultimately, if ornaments are not the ultimate reality, they're made of gold. So if you just take the ornament side of it, do ornaments ultimately end up in an absolute ornament? Do they end up in a, a fundamental ornament? No, they don't. If you are going to stick to ornaments, um, you know, jewelry and all, you're going to go down a slippery um, sliding slope to endless, you know, going from one thing to another. None of them are fundamental. None of them are ultimate. There is no ultimate um, necklace or tiara or, uh, you know, ring. They are all grounded in something which is not an ornament. If one grasps that, there is an entirely different category of uh, reality, uh, which is called gold, then you have found the ground. Now, this might be pretty simple when you're talking about clay and pots, uh, which is something that uh, you find a lot in uh, ancient uh, debates in India. I guess there are lots of pots lying around. So uh, clay and pot, one understands. Gold and ornament, one understands. But what does that mean in terms of our experienced reality? That, that's where it becomes. Uh, scary, thrilling, yeah. everything that we can think about, speak about, experience is uh, equivalent to an ornament. Then what is, what corres corresponds to gold? Is there something that corresponds to gold? Yes, there is. That's the claim in both um, uh, Madhyamaka and Advaita Vedanta. Advaita Vedanta just states it positively and Madhyamaka, I think, with greater uh, logic refuses to state it positively. It's, it's entirely aware of the dangers of sounding like another ornament and gold is another special kind of ornament. No, it isn't. It is entirely unlike anything that we have experienced, can experience, that we can speak about, even think about. Why is it very different? Advaita Vedanta gives us an insight here. It says that the ultimate reality is not an object. I say, oh, yes, it's a subject. But no, even the subject that we think about 
is a pretty objective subject. <laughs> it's a body, mind, a thought. These, according to Advaita Vedanta, all of these are objects. And what are they an object to? That is, you will have to drag it down quite a bit in order to express it in language because language was not meant to do that. Language was meant to be used in our world. So that reality, which is a non-objective reality, and you see, the, all this language makes it a little dicey because our, to our modern way of thinking, non-objective means subjective, not so real, um, something to do with maybe the humanities or something to do with uh, individual fantasies. Not at all. From an Advaitic perspective, that is the reality. The objects are um, like dreams compared to the pure subject or pure consciousness. Uh, one... Uh, uh, one uh, philosopher, Professor Arindam Chakravarti, whom I consider to be may maybe the most brilliant living Indian philosopher, he teaches at the University of Hawaii. Um, maybe you should have him on, on this show sometime. Oh, I'd love to. Uh, yes. Uh, he says he defines object as that which objects to consciousness. Oh, beautiful. Oh, that's beautiful. <laughs> Beautifully yeah. put, yes. Yeah. So, so with your understanding of, of Majamaka and also obviously um, pure consciousness, and let me let me make sure I understand that if you were to put into words the ineffability, of course, of that which cannot be named, the foundational absolute truth, it seems to me in your languaging, it would be something akin to pristine consciousness or pure consciousness. In your understanding, Swami, do you, would, you, would, would you therefore say that that is um, equivalent to emptiness? Is that your understanding? Yes. Um, I, I, you, can, you can call it pure consciousness. You can call it pure being, pristine consciousness or pristine being. Uh, it is only in that, uh, as an appearance in that, that things are revealed, things have being. Um, uh, I mean, we, we consider everything in this universe, whatever we experience, it's possible to experience because of that pure consciousness. Everything seems to have an existence because of that pure consciousness. But that in itself, is uh, not uh, a thing or not an entity which has some existence. Pure being, pure consciousness, uh, these are terms one, one could use. That is equivalent to emptiness. Again, I am making a stretch and I'm not alone in this. There are a number of uh, thinkers, especially modern thinkers, who have a more balanced view of Madhyamaka. I'm, think, I'm talking about uh, you know, Indian philosophy thinkers uh, oh. today who have a more balanced view of uh, Madhyamaka, not as nihilism, but as exactly as what Nagarjuna and Chandrakirti intended it to be, uh, who would say that uh, the emptiness there, the pure consciousness, the pristine consciousness is empty of um, the universe. Yeah. Um, and the universe as such is empty of that pure consciousness, but uh, we want us to be very careful here. Uh, when, when one says it's like, the necklace or the ring, when I say it is empty of gold, what I, what I mean is not that I'm denying that the gold alone is appearing as the necklace, but the name and form of the necklace is not substantial in itself. There's yeah. no reality there. So it's empty. Yes. And so this is where it comes back to the Shantong, empty of other, empty, yes. of, empty of adventitious defilements, empty of that which it is not. And so I think that's the, the wonderful nuance that that tradition brings in. The, the Shantong, exactly. I've read a little bit about it. And there was another minor school which sort of got squeezed out over the centuries, the Jonang school. Jonang, Jonang is almost synonymous with Shantongpa. So yes, the, exactly. The Jonang tradition and the Shantongpas are virtually the same. And so exactly. they got, you know, interestingly enough, Swamiji, they got, they got squeezed out, my understanding, because um, the Gulupas had a hard time relating to their assertions that they were proclaiming that there is something you can assert. They refer to it as Buddha nature or luminosity and the Shantong, or the Galupas got very upset. Well, here they are, they're coming back in, reasserting, bringing some, um, some sense of soul back into the picture. And so they actually went in and, and deliberately mistranslated texts and actually changed the, the trajectory of that school um, to disrepute because it was going against the, the prevailing doctrine of the time. But right. I, I think this is what I wanted to say one thing here that I think is very important. I've heard you mention this earlier. It's, it's both an Indic and a Buddhist um, pedagogical approach that is critical here because we're still talking and you're, you're, you're intimating the notion of going beyond concept. But the, in, in Buddhism, it's called the three prajnas, the three, the three wisdom tools, hearing, contemplating, meditating. 
that is only within the, the filtration. Sometimes I talk about a Swami G as this filtration and purification system that takes place. When you wake down, when you drop below the conceptual proliferation into a more contemplative embodied understanding and then experience, and then finally completely non-conceptual knowing true gnosis at the level of meditation. And so it really, it, it's, it's not a, a sophist proclamation to say, oh, if you can't put it into words, it doesn't exist. No, words cannot express this. And so the only way to really know this in a Gnostic sense is actually through deep meditation. Yes. Um, I was delighted to see this, the three wisdom tools, they correspond exactly to the three components of Jnana Yoga, the path of knowledge in Advaita Vedanta. Uh, Shravana, Manana, Nididhyasana. Shravana means literally hearing. Manana means uh, reflection or reasoning. And uh, Nididhyasana means this special technique of meditation. Um, and what are the purposes of these three steps? Uh, the first step, Shravana, you can summarize it as, what did the teacher say or what did the text say? If I can answer that question, I've completed the first step. I have the, um, the teaching. So to get the teaching, and this is so important because you cannot proceed without the teaching. Uh, right. What often happens is I get a little bit of teaching and a little bit of my own imagination, some preconceptions, that won't do. I must download the information as it is. So that is the first step of, of um, hearing, uh, Shravana. And here, I, when, I, when I teach these days, I often use a Tibetan Buddhist uh, um, instruction. Uh -huh. um, it seems, uh, I was reading somewhere, the novice master comes into the, uh, into the class and before the beginning of the entire teaching, he says, how not to listen. Don't listen like a, an upside down pot, pots again. Don't listen like an upside down pot. Don't listen like a, like a leaky pot. Don't listen like a dirty pot. An upside down pot doesn't collect any water. Whatever you pour, it flows away. So don't listen like that. Nothing goes in. Um, don't listen like a leaky pot. You listen, but then it's all, after some time, it's all gone again. You must retain what has been taught. And the third is a dirty pot. I already have misconceptions or I'm entirely skeptical. I've made up my mind about everything. Then when I listen, I filter it through those uh, preconceptions or my own fanaticism. And, and so I come to pre-established conclusions about everything. That's a dirty pot. So she says, don't listen like an upside down pot. Don't listen yeah. like a leaky pot. Don't listen like a dirty pot. And that's in, I think that's good pedagogy anywhere, anyway. Um, now, once we have listened, what's the problem now? I've heard, but I have many questions. I don't get it. I can tell you what you said, but I don't get it. So when you set up all those questions and the answers, often the texts have uh, these answers. Often you can engage with your teacher, you can engage with other students, but most, most of all, you, you try to think it through yourself. And here it's entirely reasoning. Here it's entirely philosophical reasoning, thinking it through for yourself. I remember I asked one of my teachers, Advaita Vedanta teachers, a senior monk, when I was a novice, hesitantly, that I had some doubts about what was said in you know, today's class. I still remember his answer. He's standing in front of the gates of our main monastery on the bank of the Ganga. Oh, he wow. says, ask away, young monk. Um, better brains than yours have pondered over these questions for, more, for the better part of you know, two millennium or three millennia. And so you needn't be afraid that if you ask a few questions, the entire edifice of Advaita is going to cr <laughs> crumble. So ask away, young monk. <clears throat> you ask whatever you like, and you must ask. So this is the path of knowledge where you should not take it on faith. You should not take it on you know, out of respect. You, it, you must understand. It, it's no use saying that, yes, E is equal to MC squared. It's, uh, MC squared is perfectly all right with me because you are great, sir. My professor is great, and therefore I believe it won't work. Uh, then the end of that stage of mananam is reached when you say, I not only know the teaching, but now I get it. I'm convinced. I'm sold. I've got complete clarity. Now that complete clarity, then what remains? It still remains that someone might say that I get it, but it's not a living reality to me. Uh, you know, I get it that I'm Sarva Priyananda, but more than getting it that I'm Sarva Priyananda, Sarva Priyananda is a living reality to me right now. It's a fact. It's not a theoretical, it's not an understanding, it's more than that. So 
the uh, the I am pure consciousness that I get it now, but I understand all the arguments, but it's not a living reality for me now. Um, and to convert that into a living reality, you stay with what you have studied and what you've got clarity with. And there are many, many methods of staying with it. They're all, um, they're all point, basically very subtle pointers. They use the facts of our daily experience to direct you back towards that radiance which is within, which is our real nature. You stay with that until it's a um, effortless uh, clarity, uh, which, is, uh, which is always there, always available to you. Um, technically, I'll make two points here. Uh, there is a school in Advaita Vedanta which says knowledge comes from the first stage, listening. The text gives you the knowledge. The teachings give you the knowledge. The other two, uh, reasoning and meditation, are for removing obstacles to that knowledge. Um, so reasoning removes a kind of obstacle which is called the impossibility obstacle. Mm -hmm. I am pure consciousness. I am not body-mind. Impossible. Well, why impossible, young monk? Tell me, what are your objections? When you clarify, remove those objections, that's the second stage. The impossibility uh, problem is solved. The third the, the third stage of meditation is for solving another kind of problem, which is called the contrary tendencies problem. Mm. I, I get it, what you're saying, I'm convinced, but I still go on behaving, living, the, you know, the old person is still there, the unregenerate person is still there. How do I transform that into an enlightened being? That's the, uh, the work of meditation. Yes. So, yeah. so wisdom tools, perfectly all right. And that's, that's wonderful. That's exactly what is done in Advaita Vedanta. Yeah, and I think that the other thing that uh, I think is uh, important here or should be known is that for some people who, who may challenge the first step, like the, the, the extremists who are more interested in, in pure so-called spiritual meditative work, well, I think it's incredibly important to retrofit in a certain way one's understanding because this happened to me personally. You can absolutely positively have spiritual experiences without the proper understanding and then things can really become unhinged it's it's like uh rd lang famously said you know the mystic swims in the same ocean where the psychotic drowns because sometimes if you don't have the infrastructure to help you understand what you've actually experienced that uh, opportunity can actually flip into an obstacle so that's the other reason to understand uh, work with a, this pedagogical approach I think that's beautifully stated. Uh, what you said first, that, uh, that you can have spiritual experiences and without the proper framework uh, for, the, for the intellect. Yes, the intellect may be a lower thing, but it's still, it's still there. As long as you are an individual person, you have an intellect, you have a body, a mind. So all of these have to function with the new dawn of this understanding, uh, this new realization. And for that, you need the framework, which tells you what you have got. Which, which helps you to appreciate what, in any case, if this pure light of consciousness, a pristine consciousness, Atman, Brahman, whatever you call it, in any case, it's always there. So what's really important is to point it out and then appreciate it for what, it's, it, it's, uh, it, what it really is. Um, Sri Ramakrishna used to talk about the washerman. You have to imagine an Indian washerman who collects our dirty laundry and takes it to the bank of a river and then... Um, uh, scrub, uh, washes it and scrubs it and uses a rock. So this washerman, he found a rather unique rock, which was actually a big diamond. And he didn't know what it was. And he used it for scrubbing dirty clothes. <laughs> Until uh, this long story, he goes to different people and they offer him different amounts of money for it. Until he goes, goes to a diamond merchant who says, my man, you've got the most magnificent diamond in the world. I'll give you millions of rupees for it. And so all the wants of the washerman were removed forever. Now we already have that diamond and we are like that washerman using it to scrub dirty laundry. You know, we're using it to see, hear, smell, taste, touch, to love, hate, to fight wars, to be unhappy, to, to do samsara with it. Uh, but uh, to appreciate it, one needs that teaching. Uh, yes. not, one doesn't need more and more spiritual experiences. One needs this teaching. And from the other end, the problem is one can, a, a tradition like Madhyamaka or Advaita Vedanta is also highly intellectual. Mm -hmm. So the opposite correction is also necessary. And this also, again, from the Tibetan tradition, I was reading somewhere, um, the Tibetan master says to the advanced practitioner, 
Yes, you and your guru are the same reality, which you have realized, and yet never cease to have respect for your guru. Yes, um, it is the same reality in samsara and out of it, uh, but never give up the opportunity for a retreat when you get it. So like this, multiple warnings uh, where... Uh, the sanctity of spiritual life and practice is preserved even after enlightenment. Beautiful, beautiful. I want to make a transition um, now to, to talking a little bit about dreams, Swamiji, because one of the things I so appreciate about your talks, I've listened to a number of them on YouTube, what, what you talked, the conversation we had with Khans, then your, your conversation with Upaspira. The, the role of dreams in Advaita Vedanta is extraordinarily impressive. And in and then after your reference, I, I read and studied the Madhukya Upanishad, and I realized the centrality of dreams in that arena. And obviously, it's of such importance in, in the Buddhist tradition, for goodness sake, the, the Buddha is the awakened one. It's, it's absolutely integral. And so my, my extraordinary passion for several decades, and as part of the community that we're um, speaking to right now, is using what the Tibetans refer to as the double delusion or the example dream. That's our nighttime dream, as a way to extrapolate insights into the primary dream. And so um, talk to us a little bit about it. And I have some, some more specific questions here, but as a, as a kind of a general overlay, talk to us about the importance, the centrality of the dream, um, the dream analogy in Advaita Vedanta and, and why um, you often takes, use it as one of your principal um, heuristics, one of your principal teaching tools. Right. Um, with your permission, before I jump into that, a couple of points I'd like to make yeah. about what I, what I got from, it, it's, it's related to the dream example, actually. That's what brought it up in my mind, which I got from Professor Garfield. Otherwise, I'll forget. Okay. Um, one thing which came out of that entire course was it's basically to it the contributions of Sankhapa. Oh, yeah. Um, this continuous stress upon the emptiness of all things. And there is this corresponding uh, thing in Advaita Vedanta where you talk about the falsity of the world appearance. And the very word thing about the appearance, the word used there is mithyatva or falsity. Mm -hmm. And um, in uh, emptiness school, it is shunyata or emptiness. Now, we can go off on two different uh, directions which both are uh, problematic. Uh, one is the uh, the direction of overemphasizing the emptiness part of things, that it's all empty. Uh, the, the, for example, the Karmapa uh, and some other traditions uh, we, we read, which are, I think, are a particular branch of the Kagyu, which was intensely dismissive of anything and everything. They are pointing to that ultimate the, uh, reality, but their language is uh, extremely, I would say, radical uh, emptiness. Mm -hmm. um, as against this, there are those who stress the importance of the, the relative truth, the Samriti Satyam, mm -hmm. because without that, no life is possible, no teaching is possible. Now, when you overemphasize the relative truth and then say that the absolute truth is something different, emptiness is something different, and relatively the world is here, it's solid, it's real, then you tend to lose the importance of the absolute truth or emptiness. The emptiness is meant to be applied to this life itself. And yet not to dismiss everything. Anyway, to cut a long story short, what came out of the whole discussion was Tsongkhapa's delicate balancing act, where he pointed out, if you overemphasize emptiness, it leads to a metaphysical nihilism, that nothing exists. It leads to an epistemological skepticism, that there's no possibility of any kind of true knowledge, including even the Buddhistic enlightenment or skepticism. And it leads to uh, a source of great concern for Sankhapa, monastic laxity. Anything mm -hmm. goes. Uh, uh, an ethical relativism. So to prevent ethical relativism, epistemological skepticism, and metaphysical uh, nihilism, uh, that balance between uh, that, that how do you apply emptiness? You have to apply it carefully. And Nagarjuna saw this more than 2,000 years ago. He said it's like catching a snake at the wrong end. <laughs> yeah, you, you are in serious danger if you misunderstand emptiness. Yeah. Same thing any non-dualist would recognize has plagued um, non-dual Vedanta, Advaita Vedanta, and which had great ramifications for Indian thought and philosophy in the last 800, 900 years. Uh, so 
Uh, I'll just leave it there, the contribution of Tsongkhapa. Second thing, the dream uh, analogy. There's this question of what does the Buddha know? Yeah. So on one hand, yes. So in Professor Garfield's class, there was a whole discussion, intense discussion on does the Buddha know everything or nothing? Why everything? Because it's again and again said the Buddha is omniscient. After becoming enlightened, you will be omniscient. So you obviously know everything. On the other hand, the teaching of emptiness, the dreamlike nature of reality um, suggests that whatever we know is like a dream. And hence it's false. It's not worth knowing. So the Buddha will not know all this. After all, why should the Buddha have encyclopedias of false knowledge? Exactly. Uh, so Garfield, uh, Professor Garfield, he joked, he said, uh, he, I call this the brainstem Buddha. So, brainstem Buddha. Oh, uh, brainstem Buddha. What it, what it points to is that after enlightenment, you don't know anything. You are reduced to the brainstem existence, which is a very uh, unpleasant uh, thing to think about. Is that enlightenment? No. You just have to look at the lives of people you would consider enlightened. They are, they are high-functioning individuals, probably better than most of us. Oh, my God. And, yeah. They are full of joy. They're full of life. So it's not a brainstem Buddha. The enlightened one uh, knows all that we know and knows much, much more deeply and much more truly. Yeah. The, now, that brings us to the dream example. Dream, the dream example. How is the dream example used in Advaita Vedanta? Let uh, me take the most uh, um, powerful example uh, of the Mandukya Karika. The Mandukya Upanishad is one of the major Upanishads um, on which Vedanta is based. And it is the shortest of all the Upanishads with only 12 mantras. And um, it is taken to be the most powerful of the Upanishads. There's a saying which says, if you want enlightenment and freedom, moksha, go to the Mandukya. If that doesn't work, here are 12 Upanishads and 24 Upanishads. And finally, a list of 108 Upanishads. So you better get enlightenment through the little Mandukya. <laughs> Shankara's teacher's teacher, Gaudapada, Gaudapada Acharya, he commented on the Mandukya Upanishad. In fact, he embedded the Mandukya Upanishad in his commentary called the Mandukya Karika, mm -hmm. um, which is a commentary in four chapters. The second chapter of this commentary on the Mandukya Upanishad, the second chapter is based entirely on the dream example. So there, Gaudapada leverages the dream example to point to the appearance nature of this universe. Yeah. Um, what is, so he uses the dream example to point to the falsity of the universe, because according to Advaita Vedanta, Brahman alone is real. The universe is an appearance, it's false. And you are none other than that absolute Brahman, that you are that absolute reality. So Brahma Satyam, Brahman alone is real. Jagat Mithya, the universe is an appearance. And Jiva Brahmheva Napara, you, the sentient being, are none other than the absolute reality. Um, the world is an appearance. What is the purpose of this teaching? And that's the purpose of the dream example also. There is a preliminary purpose. There's a deeper purpose. The preliminary purpose is to help you to turn your attention away from this, this bewildering, bewitching world appearance, which absorbs all of us. You need to step back. Enlightenment requires you to step back, to cut off, at least temporarily. It requires you to go away temporarily. We'll come back later. But to, so that going away, that stepping back, that looking away from it, that requires you to believe or to see this world as an appearance, to understand the appearance nature of this world. Uh, if you see it as a movie, you won't take it all that terribly seriously. So that's the preliminary point to help you. The term used is vairagya, dispassion for this world, a kind of serenity about whatever happens in this world. That itself is a very valuable thing. That's, but that's just preliminary. This, the main purpose, the deeper purpose of the dream example, the teaching about the falsity of the world is, um, is a pointer to reality. So when I say and then the classic example of the snake and the rope. And, you know, at dusk, you, somebody sees uh, that there's a snake there. It isn't a snake. It's actually a rope. It looks like a snake. And this person thinks it's a snake and he gets scared. So that's the classic example. It's not a snake. It's a rope. It's not a universe. It is Brahman, the absolute reality. This right here is the absolute reality. Um, now, the question would be, 
where is the rope? Mm. It's what you are seeing as the snake. Mm. So the teaching that the snake is false is a pointer to the reality of the rope. That which you experience as the snake is false. It's not a snake, but that very thing is the reality called the rope. Mm. Similarly, that which you are experiencing as samsara uh, is actually an appearance. It's not an absolute reality. What is reality lies right there. So it's not a separate reality. It's something else called Brahman, Atman, a thing, a God. Uh, it is this very thing itself. The moment we separate it, and we get, you know, the dualistic religions, beautiful traditions, the theistic religions, a God of the universe, separate from the universe. But then that leads to endless problems. Then you're caught in the cycle of trying to prove such a God. Um, uh, Alan Watts, oh, yeah. he, he calls it, you know, when you say that here's a pot, but there is an absolute, there's a greater reality of this pot. It's called clay. And if you see the clay is different and the pot is different, he calls it the crack pot theory. <laughs> You're caught in the endless cycle of trying to prove a separate reality called clay. No, it's that very reality which you're holding. It is the clay itself. We have to see through the, um, the pot appearance to appreciate the clay nature. Yeah. So similarly, the teaching about the dream nature of the world uh, is, um, uh, is to enable us to see through the name and form and the transactions of this world of samsara and to appreciate its uh, absolute nature as Brahman. Beautiful. Yeah. So that's the purpose of the dream example. So I, I just said one comment on what you said earlier, then I want to follow this a little bit deeper even. That um, on one level, grabbing the, the, the snake by the wrong end, one level, on one end, uh, is basically the tendency to reify even emptiness. And so the, therefore, the emptiness of emptiness is also critical. The, the emptiness itself is also empty. You can't even hang your hat on that is, is central to this because otherwise we have this tendency to, to put our allegiance into that and that becomes an even more subtle. I mean, what it was, I'm not sure if it was uh, Nagarjuna, uh, you know, if you believe in, in emptiness, you're incurable. Yes. That, you know, you have to even transcend that. But uh, Swamiji, I want to go even deeper with the, with the dream example, because for me, um, I agree wholeheartedly with everything you say. In fact, what, on one level, I, I relate to what you were asserting to <clears throat> with this notion of my languaging of the Buddha as the awakened one. I, I uh, really tried to look at what did he wake up from and what did he wake up to? Well, he woke up from the nightmare of reification. And he woke up to the illusory, empty, dreamlike nature of reality. And I think, I think that to me is, is an important way to look at the kind of the Buddha trajectory altogether. And to me, this lends even an, an even deeper inquiry that I use as a type of investigation. And I want to see how this lands with you, because to me, this is the, one of the deeper gifts of, of, of the dream yoga tradition is how that, let's say, um, when we're lost in a nighttime dream, again, this is the notion of using the double delusion as a way to gain insights into the primary delusion. For me, Swamiji, it's, it's when I'm lost in a non-lucid dream because I bring my samskaras, my habitual patterns with me. I just naturally reify a dream object. And then in an unexamined way, by immediate implication, I reify a dreamer. And then of course, there has to be some kind of connectivity between the two, i.e. consciousness. And so Buddhism refers to this as a kind of threefold impurity, subject, object, and consciousness connecting. Well, my proclamation is consciousness in Buddhist languaging, and this is where it's a little bit different from your languaging, consciousness doesn't connect, consciousness actually separates. And so from a, from a waking perspective, when I'm lost in that non-lucid dream, that's samsara, and that's why the dream can be a nightmare and I can just be scared out of my wits and in some cases even die out of fear. But if I wake up, if I have a, a more true stance from the waking stance, I can look back upon the dream arena. And now I can start to ask some very interesting questions. Yes, there is a dream object, a dream appearance. I cannot deny that. But from this perspective, I look back on the nighttime dream and I start to ask, where's the dreamer? And if I do this with real integrity, this leads me to emptiness. There is no dreamer. That's an experience of emptiness. Yeah, there is something that's still appearing. I can't deny that. In Buddhist languaging, this is the incredibly 
important notion. We haven't talked about this yet, but this is where I want to go. The notion of luminosity, Ursul, that there is this self-reflexive awareness taking place as the seeming dream object. And so therefore, this you don't even have to do nocturnal dream yoga to do this. You just have to do an insightful bit of analysis from the waking state. But you can say, oh my goodness, there really is no dreamer in there, but yet there is a dream object. What, what is taking place? Who is knowing what? And to me, this leads immediately and irrevocably, if it's stabilized, to the shattering conclusion of what the Tibetans refer to as rangare yeshe, that all appearances are reflexively aware. In other words, the dream knows itself. And in that sense, to me, Swamiji, this is the great contribution of the dream analogy. And I think by extrapolation then, and I'll, I'll pause to get your comments on this, the only reason we haven't come to the same insights in this primary dream is that we have not yet found a stance, the absolute reality, upon which we can look back and, and make those same type of insights. In other words, we haven't retreated yet to a truer, more um, authentic reality upon which we can look back upon this and say with as much conviction as we said about the nighttime dream, oh my goodness, this is a dream in that same um, kind of epistemological way. So I know I threw a lot of noodles on the wall here, but I want, I really would love to get your thoughts and opinions on that, because I think to me, this is the central gift of the dream analogy in the Buddhist tradition. I think, uh, Andrew, you've hit the nail on the proverbial nail uh, on the head. Uh, it is, uh, I would sign off entirely, any classical non-dualist Advaitin would sign off entirely on the entire range of what you have said. But before I jump into that, one thing which you said at the very beginning, the emptiness of emptiness, uh, you know, how delightful that is to an Advaitin's ear, because one of the topics uh, which an Advaitin comes to after uh, intensively discussing the falsity of the world appearance called mithyatva, falsity, is the falsity of falsity. <laughs> you see the curious, uh, I'm not even trying to conflate the two. Let's keep exactly. emptiness of emptiness and let's keep falsity of falsity. But one cannot mistake the, the curious uh, echo nature of these concepts, the language. They seem to be saying exactly the same thing. The development of thought seems to be exactly in the same direction. And they seem to be pointing exactly in the same direction. So uh, falsity of falsity, emptiness of emptiness. And yes, you're also right when you said Nagarjuna in the Madhyamaka Karika, uh, he says that it is an incurable thing if you take emptiness itself to be uh, another kind of reality. Um, emptiness is being used to point out uh, something. Uh, similarly, falsity of the universe is being used to point out something. All right. Now the dream, uh, the use of the dream example. Correct. Um, you, I know in Tibetan Buddhism, there is pretty sophisticated development of using lucid dreaming to do uh, dream yoga. I don't think there is much of that in Advaita Vedanta, but in Advaita Vedanta, what they do is, what you pointed out, all it requires is in the waking state to sit back and calmly reflect upon what happened in the dream state and to make a breakthrough there. Um, so briefly, what Gaudapada does in the second chapter of the Mandukya Karika is, First of all, he makes sure in a couple of verses that we are all on the same page. The dreams are not real. Dreams are dreams. We say we all we agree to that. We say you do, but I don't want to leave any door open for some uh, some guy who'll come in later and say, but oh, dreams are real too. <laughs> not that. And then once having made sure that we all agree that dreams are dreams, dreams are false, then he proceeds to erase the difference between our sort of common sense difference between the waking and the dream. What uh, Gaudapada wants to do is, what dreams are to you from the waking perspective that the waking is to that luminosity, that pure consciousness? I'll repeat that again. Yes. What was the dream to the waking perspective? Uh, that common example, which we, a common uh, understanding which we all have without any philosophy, without any Buddhism, Advaita, we all say that, oh, that was just a dream. Thank God that was a dream. If it was a nightmare, if it was um, a dream in which I got a million dollars in a lottery, I would say, oh, no, that was a dream. But in both cases, good or bad, I'm sure that the dream is something that is less real than my present waking. Exactly in the same way, this waking universe is... Um, 
uh, an appearance compared to that pure consciousness, that luminosity, that radiance. Um, that's exactly what uh, uh, Gaurapada wants to show. For, but his approach is to sit in the waking and look back upon the dream and then begin to see that this waking is not all that different from the dream itself. And he takes up um, objections. Tell me why you think the waking is special, unique, real, and the dream is not real. So somebody says, well, for example, um, things work here. Um, if I drink um, water here, it'll quench my thirst, but the water in the dream won't quench my thirst. And he says, you're making a category mistake. The dream water quenches thirst in the dream. Correct. And your waking water quenches thirst here. That's one objection. Utility doesn't work. And that's very important because a, a traditional Buddhist objection, um, you know, a criterion of reality um, in traditional Buddhist philosophy in the Nalanda tradition was practical efficacy. If it works, it's real. It's so similar to um, American pragmatism, for example, you know, Dewey and William James and all. If it works, it's real. But the Advaitin replies, and I think the emptiness school would agree, um, and mine, mine only school also would agree, it, things work in dreams. And you still, you say they aren't real. <laughs> the second thing would be um, public experience. Well, the dreams are in your mind, but this world is a common shared public experience. We all share this reality. So this is real. And what you dreamt about is false because it was only in your head and this, we don't see it. But again, that's not true. In the dreams also, we had a common shared reality. Um, I mean, when you were in, your, in the dream, you saw other people. Maybe you're sitting around having coffee on a you know, cup of coffee on a, and in a, um, on a table and chair. And all of those people in the dream, they uh, saw the coffee and tasted the coffee and saw the chairs and table. There was no dissonance there. Nobody in the dream said, hey, it's all in your head. I don't see anything here. So it was a shared reality there too. It's only after waking up, we say, oh, oh I see, there was a dream. So in dreams, and we understand that now with virtual reality. We can all enter into a common shared reality which doesn't exist in this waking world and computers can generate it for us like a matrix movie and things like that. Yeah. So common public experience, that also is not a criterion where you can distinguish waking and dream. Um, similarly, the idea of inside and outside. Mm. Dreams are your imaginations. They are entirely in your head, but uh, the people are there outside. The things are there outside, that's waking. But that's not true. In dreams also, we have the distinction between outside and inside. And in dreams also, we walk around thinking things and actually meeting people and having uh, interactions with people and things on the out, so-called outside, all of which turns about to be, out to be dreamt in my mind when I wake up. So like this, he goes on multiple objections, whatever you can use to distinguish dream and waking, he cuts them down showing, he makes the boundaries so fuzzy some, I think 10 objections are taken up and then erased till you begin to get this <laughs> creepy, <laughs> eerie sensation that am I awake or am I dreaming? But that's not his purpose. His purpose is now sit back and notice that the dreams are an appearance in consciousness. So is this waking an appearance in consciousness. This appearance and that appearance are not fundamentally different, different from the perspective of consciousness itself. Yeah. Now, just as a side note, what leads to um, confusion, for example, is consciousness is a translation of, in Buddhism, of the Vijnana Skanda, one of the five pillars or aggregates of personality. Here in Advaita Vedanta, you make a difference between pure consciousness, or which is called this unlimited luminosity, and the empirical consciousness. Mm -hmm. Empirical consciousness comes and goes, it is momentary, it rises and falls, uh, and it is not ultimately real. Completely, the Advaitin agrees with the Buddhist analysis of the Vijnana Skanda, the consciousness aggregate. So, finally, um, what you said, very, very important. If you said there are just two pillars of the philosophy of not to, <laughs> non duality has two pillars. One would be the appearance nature of everything, falsity. The other would be self-luminosity. Yes, exactly. Yes. Everything then ultimately is the self-luminous display uh, of this pure consciousness, uh, of the Buddha nature of all things. Um, Vedanta would be, Advaita would sign up on that without any hesitation. In fact, there's a great deal of discussion of what is self-luminosity. You use self-reflexivity 
Yeah. There, I have to be careful. I was, it was hammered into me by the at least two professors at Harvard, Gar, Professor Garfield and uh, Professor Patil, who teaches uh, Indian philosophy there at Harvard. It is a bugbear for all uh, philosophers. They will not admit self-reflexivity. Uh, so uh, a knife cutting itself, you are standing on your own head. Impossible. Such things don't exist. Yeah. So that's why uh, in, I think, mind-only school and in Advaita Vedanta, the technically correct translation would be self-luminosity. Um, it is not uh, that consciousness knowing itself the way I know this pen, not like that. Exactly. It is a self-revelation, a self-shining forth. Yes. Upanishadic language is very poetic. It says that shining, everything else shines. By its light, all is lit up. Yes. You, that luminosity shining, then the mind shines after that. And the sense organs are lit up. And the mind and the sense organs reveal a so-called external world. Exactly again like the dream. Um, you are there in your dream, you have a body and you have a mind and you have sense organs and you see things, hear things, smell, taste, touch things. And yet when you wake up, the whole thing, the objects that you saw in the dream, the body that you had in the dream and the mind and the sense organs and the experiences you had in the dream were all appearances in the dreamer's mind. Yes. Uh, yes. Well, this is, I, I, I have to just keep biting my lip. I have so many um excited comments and statements on what you're saying here. This is beautiful. I, I mean, on one level, Swamiji, it's, it's as if when we're, when we're talking about emptiness in the Buddhist tradition, emptiness is never devoid. So we were talking earlier about what is left when we cut, 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 negate, 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 um, back to no thingness, to emptiness. Well, that emptiness is not nothingness. It's actually emptiness is fullness. Yes. Empty of self means full of other on that level. But emptiness also really means is always inseparable from luminosity. They're not, they're not two different things. They're the same. Right. And so that's what that's what therefore the Shenkongpas or the Jonans then assert that luminosity. What actually is that light? And so here, this is what now we're really getting to it, because I, I want to really explore this with you, Swamiji, because <clears throat> to me now we're getting down to real non-duality. And I want to start with, with a little refinement in what you said. And this to, this, to me, these refinements are so subtle, but they're also cataclysmic. They're monumental in their subtlety and their implications. And that is that you talk about um, appearance arising in consciousness. I'm wondering, is it not more accurate to say appearance arising as consciousness? Because otherwise, there's a subtle cosmological dualism going on. It's as if you somehow still have to return to some matrix. And so another way to say this, and I'm, I'm throwing a lot of noodles against the wall here, on one level, is in fact um, consciousness the essence or the source? Because if it is the source, there's a subtle dualism involved there. And when you use the languaging appearing appearance arising in consciousness, to me, that denotes this cosmological dualism. If consciousness <clears throat> is the essence, now we're talking about non-duality. So I'm wondering how that lands with you, because this is this to me is very subtle. I see this when I read both in, in Namdul uh, Shaiva Tantra <clears throat> and Advaita Vedanta, the subtle languaging issue that to me is really actually very important, that the things don't arise in, in, in Buddhist languaging, awareness. What you uh, like to talk about is consciousness, pure consciousness. The Buddhists would probably language it as rikpa or awareness. And so things don't arise in awareness, things arise as awareness. And therefore, I'll pause there because this has really big time implications. About I think, it. yes, we'll take it step by step here. Then. Yes, please. Yeah, yes. That's because uh, as you said, uh, many things to be said about uh, each point, uh, they're all exciting. Um, I was reading Lama uh, Tulku uh, Ergen. Oh, he's a, oh, amazing. Jojo. It's amazing. Yes, a Tibetan yeah. Buddhist practitioner recommended that you, you should read that. And I'm always struck by almost exactly, it's if not the same as the Vedanta tradition, at least a mirror image of that. But um, Professor Garfield and other academicians, they, point, they taught me to look for those little differences and yeah, concentrate yeah. on that. Those yeah. are always useful. They may be irritating, but don't paper over them. They're useful. Yeah. That's where yes. the rub is. That's where the rub is. Absolutely. Yes. Yeah. Yes. And uh, you're right. One thing I've noticed about the Tibetan Buddhist approach is their 
extreme carefulness um, in regard to concepts and language. And then that's, I think, very helpful. It's not a matter of nitpicking or, you know, um, being unnecessarily, um, uh, you know, particular about it, but it's spiritually helpful, actually. Uh, um, so consciousness and appearance. In Vedanta, we say um, appearing to consciousness, mm -hmm. one, it puts the appearance outside consciousness, as it were. Mm -hmm. Go deeper, appearing in consciousness, two, and appearing as consciousness. That's beautiful. Yeah. <laughs> Makes you so, want to stand up and applaud. Yes. And um, you can see right. there are huge ancient philosophies at each stage. Appearing to consciousness, you have the ancient Sankhya dualism, a very ancient system of Indian philosophy, which was already old by the time the Buddha came. The Buddha himself learned what might be called a proto-Sankhya and a proto-yoga philosophy uh, from his uh, teachers. So there, it's a dualistic philosophy. There is an actual real universe out there, something that a modern materialist, reductionist scientist would be happy with. Material universe, everything is out there. And consciousness is a fundamental reality. And there are these two realities which somehow interact. So the universe appears to consciousness. And Sankhya stops there. Um, consciousness just needs to disentangle itself from its material entanglements, and then it's free. But these are two realities and they're separate. Um, then you have something like subjective idealism where somehow the universe arises in consciousness. And there's still, as you said, there is always the seed of duality. You still have to explain why is it that uh, there is an appearance or there are these cycles of appearance and disappearance. Consciousness itself seems to be uniform and without any um, you know, differentiation there. So why would these different things arise in consciousness? You go deeper into non-dual Vedanta, which says consciousness itself is there. But the language difference is interesting. You say the appearance as consciousness, and Advaita Vedanta would say consciousness as appearance. Oh, that's interesting. Consciousness appearing to itself. Yeah. Yeah, um, yeah I'll leave it at that. Let's um, in, investigate well, it more. And in, in what this leads to, and again, I think it's so central, Swamiji, because when we're really talking about non-duality, this is such common spiritual parlance these days. It, but what are, again, in, 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 the, in the lens, and I totally agree with you about the elegance of the Buddhist approach. I mean, this is especially the Galupas, the Sakyas, yeah. the extraordinary emphasis on debate and precision and articulation. It, it's, it's not philosophical arm cheering. It's, it's very rigorous way to take Manjushri's blade to really sharpen the mind to take it into these very particular um, insights into the nature of reality. And so for me here, this starts to get into the real crux of the matter. What is non-duality? It's, first of all, it's a non-affirming negation. You're not proclaiming anything. That in itself is very important. That's very much in line with the Prasangika approach. But to me, Swamiji, and maybe we can talk about this, what it fundamentally challenges altogether is the notion of ontology, that, that there is no ontology. There's fundamentally only epistemology. That's all there is. And so when we when we when we look at the, the notion of ontology, and I want to come back to this in a little bit, to me, this has a, a very deep connection to a, a topic that um, I'll, I'll side table so we can talk about it in a few minutes. So the notion of contraction. What is the role of contraction in the generation of a reified reality? But before we get to that, I wanted to throw that up before I forgot. What do you say about this notion that there fundamentally is no ontology? There is only knowing, pristine consciousness, epistemology. Because if you, if you assert ontology at any level, to me, that, that immediately implies some level of duality. So you go back again to the dream example, right? There's no ontology in the dream. It really is just mind. And That's so true. Um, yes. In Advaita Vedanta, the nature of ultimate reality is being consciousness is isness awareness. Now, what Advaita Vedanta would say, respond to that would be, um, all of ontology, you can discuss ontology, you can even discuss science, but only at the level of relative truth, at, at the level of the what, what uh, Advaita Vedanta calls Vyavaharika, the transactional truth or the relative truth. Um, from the perspective of Brahman, of the absolute truth, is there an ontology? Is there a hierarchy of beings and the things which exist? No. 
Um, because that absolute reality, if you call that absolute reality an ontology, fine. But uh, otherwise, no. So all ontology would be at the level of uh, uh, appearance. Yeah. But then even epistemology, that would the same thing would hold true of epistemology also. Uh, because what is uh, knowledge from an Advaitic perspective? It is that luminosity which now appears as mind and senses and a variety of modes of appearance. And then we think, talk about seeing, hearing, smelling, tasting, um, inferring uh, about scriptural knowledge. All of that now appears at the relative level uh, of, uh, of reality. Um, so from an Advaitic perspective, there is this little shift, uh, li little difference from the uh, Madhyamaka perspective. Madhyamaka perspective can be seen as an entirely epistemological exercise and leading, pointing to the reality beyond epistemology. Whereas Advaita would take both epistemology and ontology and show that ultimately there is no epistemology or ontology. It is that one unlimited being awareness. Mm. In, in Sanskrit, uh, the definition of Brahman, for example, in, in the Upanishad is unlimited um, reality awareness. Satyam Jnanam Anantam Brahman. What is Brahman? Define Brahman for me. It is unlimited. Unlimited what? Um, unlimited being, unlimited awareness. Are there two different things? No, it is being awareness. And unlimited, what do you mean by unlimited? It's not limited by space, not limited by time, and not limited by object. There are no entities there also. So, yeah. Like in Arindam Chakravarti's phrase, objects are that which objects to the radiance, so there is the those things are not real. They are appearances of that radiance itself. And so, so Swamiji, um, um, what is the role? This is a, a languaging I have not come across in Advaita Vedanta. I have come across it in Nandoshaiva Tantra. I, I'm deeply fascinated on this right now. Um, the the role of contraction in the generation of ontology and the generation of samsara, almost like an original sin. And I, I'm very interested in Advaita Vedanta languaging or even your understanding of, of the Upanishads and that lens. What, what is the role of contraction in the generation of samsara? Right. This is a crucial point in which Advaita would be critical of, say, Kashmiri Shaivism or another Vedantic system called Vishishta Advaita, qualified monism. One way of looking at it is that there's this infinite reality which contracts itself, limits itself into a material universe, which reduces itself into a material universe, but somehow retaining its infinite free nature. That would be the Kashmir Shaiva uh, understanding. If you say, what is the fundamental difference between non-dual Vedanta and Kashmir Shaivism? Mm -hmm. It's a fascinating study, actually. Um, Kashmiri Shaivism, which, by the way, is a sort of umbrella term for a variety of thought systems, spiritual systems, least which developed. Schools. Yeah, at least five schools, right? Multiple schools, which yeah. developed in Kashmir over a period of seven, eight hundred years at least. Um, and there were heavy Buddhist influences there. Yes. If you read the commentaries of Abhinava Gupta and other Utpala Deva, um, uh, you can clearly see they are in debate with uh, Buddhist interlocutors. Um, all right, so here are the big differences. In Kashmiri Shaivism, the world is real. The absolute reality is Shiva, it's real. And the universe, which is none other than Shiva, it's a vibration, it's, an exp it's a contraction of the infinite nature of Shiva. It's real too, which makes for a huge difference with uh, systems like Madhyamaka and Advaita Vedanta. Advaita Vedanta, so that, for example, Kashmir Shaivism would not uh, give any importance to the two levels of truth. There's only one level of truth. There is this universe, which is a spiritual reality, which is a vibrating spiritual reality given to expansion and contraction, expansion into its freedom and contraction into this world. Um, they will not say world appearance, this world, this, this uh, universe. So Shiva is real and the world is real. How do you, how do you, match the changeless and the ever-changing. And they say that um, Shiva is a vibrating reality. Mm. So consciousness has vibrations. They call it spanta, the doctrine of it's vibration. Yes, exactly. Yes. And uh, so it's... So Advaita Vedanta would have... There will be a whole range of red flags which should come up from, mm. for, for Advaita Vedanta when they hear all this. From an Advaitic perspective, 
if you have to critique this, mm -hmm. then uh, it would be that you are importing the lower truth into the higher truth. Mm -hmm. uh, you are uh, importing um, the world appearance into the absolute. Mm -hmm. um, uh, in, in the sense of giving the world, it is the world, absolute is the world appearance. The absolute world appearance is nothing other than the absolute. That is true. Mm -hmm. But it's almost like you're giving the world appearance a reality mm -hmm. and the absolute a reality then you're putting the world appearance in the absolute in some sense. Mm. Uh, you're putting them at the same level. Uh, the, you're putting them in a, in a continuum instead of a sharp break. In Advaita Vedanta or in Madhyamaka, there is a sharp epistemological break, jump between relative truth and the absolute. Um, but if you want to make it a continuous reality, then uh, it, it tends to, I would say, pantheism, the Kashmiri uh, Shaivism. Shiva is this universe. Mm. So what's wrong with that? Mm. Well, logically, there are any number of, you know, it, it would uh, send all the monks' robes into a flap if, if, <laughs> they, if it uh, tell them these things. Um, <laughs> so, I, I mean, I can imagine the uh, Galupa, the uh, yellow hats, throwing in, you know, like the hats in despair pro probably at this kind of terrible inconsistencies. Um, but the Kashmiri Shaivas are pretty blithe about these things. Mm. They may have a point. Their point may be, again, this is my understanding, uh -huh. is that you have argued it too much. You non-dualists or the Madhyamakas, you have taken reason beyond uh, reality. Uh, you have followed reason through, um, you know, there can be a thing as so much, uh, as too much, uh, cutting it too fine. You cut it too fine, you miss reality. Mm. If your reasoning is too crude, you don't grasp exactly. reality. Exactly. Uh, yeah. It might be. Who knows? Uh, but the thing is, if you're going to follow reason, it's, <laughs> you have to be reasoned. If at one point, if you jump into magical thinking, then why do this exercise at all? Yeah. Uh, so, is does consciousness vibrate? Yeah. I mean, uh, let me give a simple dialectic which an, a non-dualist, an Advaitin would deploy against this kind okay. of thing. The vibration of consciousness. Is this vibration of consciousness, does it appear to consciousness or not? If it appears to consciousness, but yes, there is an experience of the vibration of consciousness, then this vibration is an appearance to consciousness. It cannot be a vibration of consciousness. It is, uh, it is it, that vibration does not exist without consciousness. That's true. It's an entirely dependent reality on consciousness. But then in that case, it's not the essential nature of consciousness. Um, it is not consciousness itself which is actually vibrating. Hmm. Uh, and then you are saying that consciousness is subject to change. Uh, so uh, it becomes an object. Uh, okay. It's like Kashmiri Shaiva. See, the, the essence, if you ask the Kashmiri Shaivas, what is the nature of that ultimate reality? How would you define it? Would you define it as pure consciousness? They say, no, that's what the Advaitins do. Uh, but we define it as the technical terms are prakasha vimarsha. Yeah. Consciousness, which is also aware of itself. Uh, so in some of the deities, you have this beautiful image of Shiva looking into a mirror. Um, and the whole thing is the absolute reality. Shiva is aware of himself uh, as this. You see, that's a beautiful thing. What's wrong with that? Well, what is wrong with that is, according from an Advaitic perspective, you are importing an activity of the mind into the absolute nature of that radiance. It's that radiance being aware of itself uh, not in that sense, not in the way you are thinking about it. Yeah, yeah. yeah. It's, it's it's so nuanced, it's so elegant, it's so subtle. Uh, what when you study um, Abhinava Gupta or Tengmaraja, what do you learn from Nandul Shaiva Tantra? I mean, because oh. I know you're I know you're a fan. I know you 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 study it in great depth. You speak with so, such elegance about it. But in, in a little akin to like what you have learned from uh, Majamika. What do you glean from the, the Kashmiri schools that you find, oh, wow, this is great. We, we don't have this. They're saying this. Fantastic. There's an enormous amount to be learned from Kashmiri Shaivism. Um, what I might call simply practical spirituality. Mm. You see, all my objections, if I, if I were pressed to object against uh, Kashmiri Shaivism, all my objections would be logical, would be philosophical, um, but um, not practical. One thing you run up against in Advaita Vedanta, for example, is um, when you're teaching it, and that's the purpose of it, you're teaching it as a path to freedom. 
uh, often the reaction would be, okay, what do we do now? Yeah, and, exactly, exactly. <laughs> and Advaita Vedanta would, would sigh and roll its eyes and metaphorically and say that, you listen again, you, you haven't got it. If you've got it, you wouldn't even be asking that question. What do I do next? <laughs> Yeah. Uh, listen to me all over all over again. I repeat that. Whereas Kashmiri Shaiva says, come to me. We have endless things for you to do. Uh, yeah, yeah. yeah. And there's a beautiful verse. And there are endless things. I mean, there are multiple levels of spiritual practice. But before going into that, there's a beautiful verse by Abhinava Gupta, I think. Yes. Which says, if in one flash of self-intuitive understanding, you can realize that you are Shiva, then none of these techniques are necessary for you. Mm. That's what Advaita Vedanta would say. That's what we're talking about. Mm. But if it does, doesn't work, we have enormous technologies of spiritual enlightenment. I mean, it just doesn't end. Advaita Vedanta doesn't seem to have anything for you to do or practice. And Kashmiri Shaivism has no end of things for you to practice. So they talk about four layers, uh, four levels of uh, spiritual uh, paths, for, paths to enlightenment. The highest is the no path path. It is called Anubaya. the uh, Anubhaya. There is no path. And spiritual realization is by the grace of the guru or just spontaneous. And there have been examples of people spontaneously awakening, whether it's Ramana Maharshi, or even in modern times, if you look at the, the narratives of um, Eckhart Tolle and some others, yeah. it's, it's a few people seem to spontaneously awaken. It's possible. It's not an impossible thing. Sure. Of course, you can't sit around, wait, wait for it to happen. So the next level of uh, techniques is called the Shambhava Upaya, which uses Shiva as a support for spiritual practice. Mm -hmm. And if you see what is taught there, that's very similar to Advaita Vedanta. You listen to these teachings, you, uh, you see, it's, it's a kind of approach which is trying to get you to see something. So that's the, uh, <clears throat> the Upaya based on Shiva. That's my takeaway, by the way. Uh, the Kashmiri Shaivism would, if you ask Kashmiri Shaiva experts, they would put classify Advaita one step below that. They would say Advaita is actually the third uh, approach, which is uh, Shakta Upaya, which takes the Divine Mother or Shakti as the support for spiritual practice. That's where you have analytical reasoning, you have uh, um, meditation, you have an entire technology of mantras, which you don't have in Advaita Vedanta. I mean, it, it sort of skips over the whole thing. Um, there's some analysis of Om, but that's still a very philosophical, metaphysical analysis. But the whole mystical tradition of mantras, and, and there they talk about how language is that which traps us in samsara, and language properly understood can free us from samsara, but liberating language is the language of mantras. So it's very fascinating, actually, and, and it's all very elaborate. As you go from the no path path to the path of Shiva, to the path of the Divine Mother of Shakti, it becomes more complicated, more sophisticated, more elaborate. And finally, you come to the path of the sentient being, um, the Anva Upaya. The, 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 the word used in Kashmiri Shaivism is the atomic being, which is us, basically, our, our present condition. There, the, it's endless elaboration. You have ritualistic worship, you have mudras, and so many things are there. I don't know uh, even the fraction of all of that. Probably you can pack all of Hinduism into, into that stage. So you have this whole range, no path path, the path of Shiva, the path of the Divine Mother, the path of Jiva, the sentient being or the Anu in, in Kashmiri Shaiva, uh, Shaiva terminology. And it's compared to the pristine simplicity of Advaita Vedanta, for example, this is endlessly elaborate. It's uh, the difference between, I would say, a Zen meditation hall and a Hindu temple. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Uh, a, a friend of mine, Swami Medananda, who's a uh, very scholarly monk, he called Kashmiri Shaivism a, a Baroque philosophy. <laughs> That's beautiful. Yeah, Rococo Baroque. Just Rococo Baroque. Baroque, exactly, yeah. That's fantastic. You know, there's so much here that's completely resonant with my understanding of even the Buddhist approach, Swamiji, where it's very interesting that it, it, at the highest levels, the, the more advanced practices, the simpler the get, the less there is to say. And the more you descend uh, based on that schema that you just presented, um, the 84,000 dharmas in the Buddhist languaging are basically there as Uzupaya, skillful means, to meet the complexities of the modern mind, so to speak. Absolutely. In a, certain way, in a certain way, then, this becomes particularly interesting for me um, in, in terms of 
what you would see as, as, as a reflective criticism of Advaita Vedanta, because you seem to be intimating it that on one level, there is this, this almost, dare I say, absolutistic, there is there's a possibility of absolutism with Advaita Vedanta, where um, just do nothing, or as I say, do nothing, but do it well. The kind of Nike approach, just do it. Well, I think, so to speak, theoretically, that is utterly completely viable, that if, if the nature of reality already is awake, it's divine, it's, it's Shiva, or whatever you want to call it, yes, then the only real issue is uh, recognition, as actually, in fact, in the recognition sutras. I mean, that's it. That's all you have to do. But to me, Swamiji, it seems like a, a somewhat a reasonable critique of that is the absolutistic approach and how it doesn't adhere or doesn't uh, honor the complexities of karma and momentum, the habit patterns that are sure it's great. I can have a Shakti pod, I can have a pointing out transmission, I can have an empowerment, I see the blazing splendor of Kala Chakra or whatever. But then again, like that thunderclap, then the thunder of my habitual patterns comes back in. What do I do with that? Well, you can say, well, then go back, listen to the teachings, go back, listen. Well, we're human doers more than we're human beings, right? And so would, would that be a viable criticism or critique from your own perspective of Advaita Vedanta that it can lean towards an abs absolutistic approach? Indeed. Uh, indeed, you're absolutely right. Uh, in, in fact, in, the critique can be uh, couched in these terms. From a Kashmiri Shaiva perspective, one can ask Advaita Vedanta, what is the purpose of Advaita Vedanta, if we ask? Mm. And Advaitans will have to say that you are the absolute, but there is this uh, adventitious ignorance, and that has to be removed. So the Kashmiri Shaiva would say then say that then um, the purpose of uh, Advaita Vedanta and indeed all spiritual practice is to remove the obstacles to the already shining forth perfect nature of reality. Yeah. Yes, that's true. In that case, the removal of the obstacles would have to be tailored to the obstacles, I guess. If the obstacles are endlessly complex, which we poor humanity in our own way, we have set up forces, we have set into force, uh, motion forces over many lifetimes, which are endlessly complex, nasty, low, far below the pristine magnificence of Advaita Vedanta, right. then these would have to be untangled at our uh, level. And so all these technologies of spiritual practices, these are means of untangling the traps we have set for ourselves. Yes, exactly. And because these traps are endlessly varied and complex, the techniques also might be of a va uh, various kinds. And the proof of the uh, pudding is in the eating, that's the phrase. Yes. So yes. when we practice that, we find immediate, if, even if limited efficacy, but still immediate efficacy, it works, it solved this problem, this problem of distraction, this problem of envy, this problem of lust, it solved it for me. Whereas your magnificent teaching of unlimited existence, consciousness, bliss is great, but it was not working at my poor little human level. Yeah, yeah. So would you admit the efficacy of these spiritual practices? And Advaita would have to agree, yes. But they are emphasizing something. And they're talking about the top of the Everest, yeah. uh, where we are wending our way up the valley to, you know, like we are several thousand feet below. That might be one way of putting it. Um, I mean, the, if you look at it, all the critique of Kashmiri Shaivism from an Advaitic perspective would be a very philosophical critique, would be, whereas the Kashmiri Shaiva critique of Advaita Vedanta would be both philosophical and practical. The philosophical yeah. side of it won't probably stand, but the yeah. practical side of it does stand. I spoke with Professor Timal Sina, oh, Stanish, yeah. yes. In San Diego, right? In For San Diego. Uh, he, he's both a teacher and an avid practitioner of uh, Kashmiri Shaivism. Beautiful. And I said, um, would you agree if I characterized Kashmiri Shaivism, the whole system, as a philosophy based on the phenomenology of spiritual life? And he said, that's great. That's exactly what it is. Uh, if in spiritual life, if you look at the shared spiritual heritage of humanity all across the world, religions, you know, the things that we have done and experiences which mystics have had over millennia, if you were to include all of that and not exclude them, if you were to include all of that and at every stage and every experience you give some validity to it, uh, some part in your whole system, then you get a, this Baroque system of Kashmir Shaivism. 
if you dismiss all of that and say it is all an appearance in and of that uh, limitless radiance, well, that's fine. That's the truth. But then you have <laughs> you have jumped over the entire journey, basically. Yeah, yeah. This uh, this is so unbelievably rich, and it's one reason I, I'm such a fan of yours, Swamiji, because you're I'm not sure you are aware of this languaging, but there, there's a, a quite a popular movement these days of integral studies um, and the integral movement, and and you are so much an integral um, explorer. You you have the, the the heart and the capacity to honor and incorporate so many bandwidths of truth from so many different traditions that, that I find really inspiring. It's, it's humbling, it's, it's um, mind opening. And to me, it's like, I think the Buddha himself allegedly once said, wherever you find the truth, you will find my Dharma. And just because the truth comes in the Majamaka point of view, at a Vedanta point of view, a Kashmiri point of view, or the, the topic I now want to transition into briefly on um, a scientific point of view, I think it's this incredibly um, uh, open quality of your being that is just so uh, inspiring to me. Um, well, thank you. But I think in this day and age, to some extent, we are all integral seekers. We are going to be a genuine seeker this, in this day and age. I think we are almost naturally open to various streams of thought and teaching and practice. Well, see, it seems. I, I hope it continues to grow that way. But along those lines, Swamiji, then uh, you, you have a relatively facile uh, or deep understanding, I should say, of um, science and its contributions and, and promise and peril. So talk to us a little bit about what you see as the promise and peril of especially neuroscience. There's, uh, I'm dear friends with Richie Davidson and all these wonderful, amazing thinkers in the uh, Center for the Investigation of Healthy Minds and you know the Dalai Lama's 30-year mission to bring East and West together on this level. What is, what is your understanding and um, just engagement with the role of Western science and in particular neuroscience to these wisdom traditions. And I have some more specific questions after that, but it just as a general umbrella topic. What, how do you see, what, are the, what is the promise and peril of science in the role of ancient wisdom? I think we have to recognize and honor the fact that we live in an age of science, of, of what we call modern science today. Uh, it will not do to uh, you know, be dogmatically fixed in a philosophy which was uh, talked about a thousand years ago or 2000 years ago. I mean, we must recognize people like Nagarjuna or Chandrakirti or Tsongkhapa, they were such deep thinkers and so alive. That's why they were able to comment on what was going on in their time and rethink everything. So they would have been very open to the insights of science today. I mean, look at their representative, the Dalai Lama himself. So uh, how amazingly open he is to insights from neuroscience. Swami Vivekananda, very categorically, he stated that I'm firmly convinced that the claims of religion <coughs> have to be put to the same rigorous tests uh, of science um, as do any other claims in the world. And if some of them do not measure up to those rigorous standards, we must let go of them, no matter how soothing or comforting those beliefs are. Um, and then he says, see, the, the fear is in the world of religion that probably we will not be able to measure up those to those rigorous standards. And maybe we just attack those standards themselves. Um, but Vivekananda said, I'm firmly convinced that the core truths of spirituality will survive this test uh, for he says because they have an internal mandate i don't know what he meant by that he just leaves it there i i feel that he means the self luminosity uh, yeah. uh, uh, which is the self shining nature of consciousness which is the internal mandate uh, which cannot be disproved ever uh, so yes for this is the first point that we live in an age of science and we must uh, honor science it's a new way of looking at it i mean uh, 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 looking at um, spirituality and in these ancient philosophies, uh, this is also inescapable. This is the way we have been trained, all of us. We have been trained to think in that way. So it's very good to engage with science and necessary to engage with science. The Dalai Lama did it 100 years before that, Swami Vivekananda. He associated closely with William James, Tesla, for example. There was, he set up a whole conversation with uh, uh, Tesla, the scientist, not the car. <laughs> yeah, right. <laughs> Um, yes, so we must do that. Uh, we must be open to it. 
do, do these systems, Madhyamaka or Advaita Vedanta, do they need science in one sense? No, because they can serve the purpose that is of enlightenment, spiritual freedom by themselves as they have been for centuries or millennia now. On the other hand, we can gain both ways. Science can gain with an engagement with these systems and these systems can gain. It can, they can become new and enriched and reinvigorated with scientific insights. You know, yes, this cross-pollination, cro this cross-pollination of ideas, it can happen. I'm sure uh, it is going to happen more and more. What is the danger? Let me put it this way. The, the danger is the current paradigm of science. Yeah. Uh, the paradigm of science, for very good reasons, is an objective paradigm. Yeah, materialistic. Yeah. Still. Materialist. So everything must be an object, an objective study. The very nature of the term objective is a term of praise. Subjective is somehow derogatory, mm -hmm. uh, pejorative. So this, this is a problem. When it is we're talking about an object, some force out there, some material out there, a rock out there, a planet out there. This is fine. This paradigm works. And that's why this paradigm is there. But when you are talking about the subject itself, I mean, forget pure consciousness, the radiance, <laughs> forget that. Uh, for, uh, just take up mind, perception. Mm -hmm. When um, the object of study is the subject itself, then it will not do to wish away the subject or try to reduce the subject to... Let me give an example. Daniel Dennett and others who oh, are yeah. <laughs> deeply reductionistic, they would nothing would make them happier than for consciousness to disappear. <laughs> well, he <laughs> said what he even said was he posited, you know, a challenging the status of consciousness, which is the most absurd thing. It's the only thing we actually ever have, and he's trying to uh, attempt to dismiss it, right? Incredible. You see, why do they do that? I, I asked David Chalmers once, that those who uh, um, you know criticize this, your um, the, what you're talking about, the hard problem of consciousness, don't they see it that what you just said, consciousness is the first and the most obvious thing that we always ever have had, and it has to. It's necessarily that it's only to consciousness that everything else is revealed. And uh, he just gave a sort of uncertain reply. He says it's not that they don't see it; uh, they don't see that absurdity of this. But the thing is. They are led to, now I'm, I'm reading my thing into David Chalmers' reply. Sure. It is the paradigm which is forcing them into that particularly yeah. unsavory corner. Yeah. Everything must be a thing. Yeah. And therefore consciousness, yeah. if it does exist, and I, I'm forced to admit something like consciousness does exist, it must be a thing. Yeah. Now, it's not obviously a tangible thing, so it must be a byproduct or a, you know, an epiphenomenon of something tangible like the little electrical activities in the brain. It doesn't work. Yeah. This approach doesn't work. Um, Ed Witten, who is... Oh, I know. Sure, the physicist from... Princeton. The physicist. I, somebody wrote about him. He's the closest thing to Einstein that we have got. I mean, if, if you quote him, the neuroscientist will say, well, it, neuroscience is not his subject. Consciousness studies is not his subject. But still... I mean, you give credit to an enormous intelligence when you come across it. So he says, it's interesting that, that there's this little clip, you can find it on YouTube if you look, search for Ed Witten on consciousness. Oh, wow, okay. Yeah, some interviewer, in some um, journalist, in some science interview, he suddenly popped this question. I'm sure the whole interview was about physics, but this question he popped up, he popped this question to Ed Witten. What about consciousness, the problem of consciousness? And uh, Ed Witten says, I think as the years go by, we will learn more and more about the brain. We'll learn a lot about the brain, but consciousness will still remain a mystery. Oh, that's fantastic. Good for him. Yes. I mean, good for him. And, and, and if you, exactly, my, my sentiments exactly. But if you see that the journalist misunderstood him completely. The next question was, oh, you want consciousness to remain a mystery. And Witten just shakes his head and smiles a little bit. <laughs> not, that's not what I meant. You can't reduce it. Your paradigm is forcing you to reduce everything to matter and processes of matter. Doesn't work. Yeah. I, I mean, I can share with you, um, two years back at Harvard, one of the courses which I took was um, the philosophy of mind. Hmm. So like any, it, it gave a, gives you a nice survey of all the uh, uh, papers in this field uh, till re most recent papers. So it starts with Descartes 300 hmm. years back. And then it works its way to whatever was done in the 20th century, more or less. 
I felt after reading those things, I felt the last person who said anything interesting was Descartes, 300 years back, <laughs> who ended up with his, you know, he started his project of complete doubt um, in his search for the certain basis of knowledge. And he ended up with the my, famous mind-body dualism. And that's where the modern philosophy of mind has been stuck for 300 years. If you look at all the papers, which were part of our syllabus, half of the papers are trying to reduce yeah. consciousness and mind to matter, uh, to, eat, yeah, to the brain, to the uh, neurology, uh, or to behavior, or to language. Uh, there was a time in the Oxford common, uh, la common language philosophers who tried to say that everything was a delusion created by our misuse of language. So whatever, one whole set of papers like that, and the other half of the syllabus is uh, papers by people who point out, guys, sorry, this is not working. <laughs> you cannot reduce mind or consciousness to language. Um, you know, multiple philosophers giving thought experiments to show that there is something beyond just, for example, information uh, in consciousness. Yeah. I mean, right there in MIT, they are designing um, robots powered by AI to do everything that we can do. Those robots can take decisions. They can, they obviously can, they can see and hear. They have sensor, sensory systems. Um, they are powered by sophisticated AI programs. They can drive cars, for example. Um, so many things, everything that a mind can do, a robot can also do powered by AI. But they don't see the amazing thing about it. That robot, which can do, which can drive a car just like you. That means it can see, it can hear, it can take decisions. Yet, there is no internal feel there. There is no first person experience there. Somebody might ask, how do you know? Well, ask those engineers in MIT and Google and uh, have you uh, programmed it for self-consciousness? They'll say, obviously not. There's nothing like that there. It's a machine, which means consciousness is very distinct from all the other processes which we club together with consciousness. Yes. Uh, that distinction is still lost upon them. I mean, you will be surprised when we talked about consciousness in that class at, at Harvard University, very smart young people. One uh, young man a little, looking a little puzzled uh, asked, said to me, I'm not sure what you mean by consciousness. Probably it is not a scientific uh, entity. It's something you do in the humanities. <laughs> so he thinks that consciousness is something poetic, something right. of fantasy <laughs> or, yeah, or a social consciousness, something like that. Yeah. Something that is most vivid and, and the first thing that we have. But luckily, some uh, philosophers and some scientists are beginning to see the most, this most obvious thing very clearly and beginning to recognize that you cannot reduce consciousness to just little activi activities in the brain and neurons. This is, this is, this is so exciting to me. I mean, first of all, a, a couple of comments. Really, Swamiji, we still live in Aristotle's world, don't we? I mean, we really do. His law, his laws of thought, the, the, the Boolean approach, black, white, the binary thinking. We still live in the Greek real, uh, world, in my opinion. And, and to me, it, it's a little bit like, um, what did I hear a, a scientist, one scientist say, um, I, I wouldn't believe it even if it was true. It, you know, they're, 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 they're so ensconced in this reductionist world that my friend Ken Wilber talks about everything is fundamentally reducible to frisky dirt, which is a wonderful way of looking at it. And so to me, the, the really great, and this is, this is a radical shift, the great gift of these non-dualism traditions is this um, a, amazing swing from reductionism to, this is my languaging, to a type of elevationism. Instead of shrink wrapping and reducing everything to matter, this re this elevates everything to, to awareness, consciousness, mind, and, and therefore the byproduct of that is in fact a sacred world, a, a, a world that is much more in resonance with the way reality actually is. And unless people contest the, the validity of that approach, well, look at the consequences of the previous worldview. Look at the consequences of materialism and reductionism. It's absolutely destroying this planet because of a complete fundamental disconnect to the nature of reality. And so I wanna start to close with these incredibly practical um, hits on this is that we may be sitting here talking about this most elevated 
spirituality, these incredibly sophisticated doctrines. But in my estimation, the, the cash value here, I think William James's term, the cash value is if you really take this to heart and you live from this place, this is a radical game changer. Because first of all, re you realize you're inextricably connected not only to every other person on this planet, every other sentient beings, but to the planet itself. And so this type of view, far from being ineffectual, has tremendous efficacy in terms of propelling us towards a sacred relationship to our environment and to each other. And so lest we think, oh, this is just pejorative philosophical spiritual rhetoric, oh my goodness, far from it. I mean, isn't it true that when we take this to heart and mind, this changes everything. It changes the way you relate <clears throat> to the entire planet. So <clears throat> yeah, I wanted to throw that out. And, and before I forget, in addition to the role of science, Omiji, I also wanted to ask you, um, as we start to close up, the place of psychology. So the, in, in my view of the nature of an exploration of mind and reality, I see it as a psycho-spiritual spectrum of development, that, that we shouldn't really be dismissive of even some Freudian tenets about re working with mind. So I'm curious, um, from your perspective, what, what is the role or the place of psychology in, in Advaita Vedanta or your understanding of it in, in uh, just contemporary applications of this ancient wisdom? Right. I think one of the greatest benefits that this kind of approach, so the Tibetan Madhyamaka or the um, Advaita Vedanta philosophy can give us, is that it gives us all the benefits of traditional religion without uh, contradicting science, without contradicting reason. Uh, it's something that in today's world, it's impossible to accept um, a dualistic, theistic uh, kind of religion, how, no matter how soothing and comforting that it might be. It's still difficult to accept it because we live in a predominantly scientific world. I mean, you, the moment you talk, start talking about God and heaven and all of that, uh, then you run up against Richard Dawkins and Christopher Hitchens and Daniel Dennett, Sam Harris. Whereas, the, those critiques of um, traditional religions fall flat against, uh, say, Madhyamaka or Advaita Vedanta, which is why I think someone like Sam Harris, for example, he has said that um, while remaining completely against all kinds of religion, he says, we must admit the traditions like, uh, he mentions these two, uh, Advaita and Madhyamaka, uh, Tibetan Madhyamaka, have an irreducible core of truth. Uh, to them. And this core of truth is of enormous importance and significance for humanity. Uh, it gives meaning back to life. Yeah. It, uh, it gives us a meaningful life. It gives us a high view, a, a noble view of life, the purpose of life, and the possibility of a noble and high and enriching life uh, with cascading effects, positive effects on society, on the environment, on the planet. All of that becomes possible with this kind of philosophy in the background of our lives. Um, it does not contradict science. It does not contradict other religions. Uh, so there's no possibility of religious. So when you're talking about, you're, what you're talking about is the spiritualization of life. You're not talking about a theologizing, a, 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 like a theological society. No, it's, it's not that one religion is dominates and you have to follow that religion or else. Nothing like that at all. It's such a broad spirituality that you can accommodate everybody uh, from the believer to the atheist in, in this uh, spectrum. Um, psychology, from an Advaitic perspective, psychology is more in the realm of uh, yoga philosophy mm. and um, tantra, I would say. Mm. Uh, Advaita sort of jumps over the mind to go to the sort of the light which radiates through the mind, you know, the underlying consciousness itself. Yeah. Um, but psychology is very important because it mediates between uh, the world of science and the world of spirituality. Uh, it mediates between our um, material everyday existence and our ultimate goals of spiritual enlightenment. And the, the whole problem and the whole solution lies in the domain of the mind, in the domain of psychology. And that's a whole different issue altogether. Yeah. Well, Swamiji, I, I, I'm going to finish with one um, kind of prepared question. I, I ask this because um, I find that the answers I receive from the individuals, I do posit this question. I always remember them and they seem to go right to the nintig, to the hard essence. And that is that 
we have covered such an amazing amount of material over these last um, almost two hours. And you are such a wealth of, of resource. But I, I want to pre present to you uh, a thought experiment that if you realize on the spot right now, you only had a minute left to live, what would be the irreducible instruction? What would be your irreducible teaching? Mm. The core Advaitic teaching, you are that. So, um, you know, I often feel that the most mature way of living, even if it's the last minute of your life, is what's the best time of our lives? It's here, right now, where we are. Uh, where is the best place you have ever lived? Here. Yeah. And the people you are around with in the circumstances, this circumstance, this set of people, uh, it's because not because of anything else, except that the divine is always present here and now, shining forth, ever perfect. Mm -hmm. uh, that's a sign of maturity, of spiritual maturity. Well, and with that, I can only say that you exemplify that, the radiance of your, your countenance, your being, your joy, <laughs> your childlike wonder is, is so contagious and it's so lovable. And so um, deep, deep bow of gratitude with, on uh, behalf Thank of Thank you so much. This has been so rich and so wonderful. I, I'm so grateful you're a very busy individual and I've been looking forward to this for months and I have not been disappointed. It's been marvelously rich. Thank you so much, Sonia. Thank you, Andrew. Take care, stay safe. Take care.